memory structure. A lot of films and TV shows depict the mind as a set of places where ideas and memories are free to roam and wander. In the TV series Sherlock, the eponymous Holmes sometimes solves mysteries by entering his mind palace, reconstructing events by roaming London and the living conversations he's had with witnesses and informants. Christopher Nolan's 2010 film Inception and the Phineas and Ferb 2012 episode Monster from the Rim both involve exploring deemscapes as if they were physical places. Hopes and fears roam city streets and surreal scenes as people traversing multiple layers of consciousness nested within each other. The well-awarded 2015 Disney Pixar film Inside Out takes on memory and cognition more directly. A central processing station hovers over a city of experiences and aspirations, but the of thought is a literal tale spanning the entirety of consciousness. Emotions are embodied as agentic beings with their own emotions, and memories are stored in orbs organized like a library. And the amazing thing is that these shows and films are somewhat right. Our mind does have compartment-like places where everything is stored and processed in the form of memories. Formally speaking, memory is a dynamic system that allows us to retain and draw on our past experiences and use that information at present. We study memory by looking at its architecture, the organization of its many components, and processes, its activities and mechanisms, which, by responding to our individual characteristics, goals, expectations, and situational demands, allow us to use our memories for our daily needs and social interactions. So, in this lesson, let's enter our mind palaces and see how we remember all the things. Incoming information is processed across many components of the memory system, which differ in purpose and capacity. The memory system has been most extensively studied using the framework of information processing theory, which describes how the information we perceive from the environment is taken in, organized, and applied based on our current needs. We've actually seen the first parts of this processing system in attention when we look at Colin Cherry's dichotic listening studies, Daniel Broadbent's filter model, and Antisman's attenuation theory, where information moves from outside and into our heads. Richard Atkinson and Richard Schiffrin then introduce their multi-store or modern model of memory to show what happens inside the head. In their model, Atkinson and Schiffrin say that we have three types of memory or stores that serve different purposes, have different capacities, and hold on to information for different durations. These are the structural features of memory. When we first take in stimuli through sensation, information goes to the sensory store. Because of the principles of representation and transformation, remember that the memory system works not on the original stimulus, but their neural equivalents such as electrical signals and brain activation. The sensory store has a lot of subcomponents, each representing one of our sensory modalities, but we look at the two that have been the interest of most study of memory. Iconic memory works on visual information that it stores for 0.5 to 1.6 seconds. That isn't long, but it makes sense. If you look in front of you and just stare for a while, information is coming in from all parts of the visual field, and that's too much to work with. And to check the duration for yourself, look at a well-lighted thing in front of you and stare at it without blinking for around 30 seconds. Then close your eyes quickly. You'll see an after image of the thing you're looking at, but it will slowly fade in a few seconds. This phenomenon is called persistence of vision, the fact that what we've just seen lingers around for a bit before disappearing. Meanwhile, echoic memory deals with auditory information, but it stores for a relatively longer 2 to 4 seconds. Again, considering that most of our listening is devoted to human speech that happens across time, we need to store more sound information for a longer duration so we can understand appearances, especially long ones as in the case of conversation. Capacity-wise, we're not sure of how much iconic and echoic memory can actually hold because, as we've seen in the theories of attention, it would depend on how much we discard at any time. Following Broadbent, we could have greater sensory store capacities because irrelevant stimuli are immediately discarded from memory. Meanwhile, Tysman and late selection theorists might say that we take up more space at any time because we just attenuate stimuli based on priority, but nothing is really discarded until short-term memory decides what's needed. Either way, 
If sensory memories are kept in store and we attend to what information they provide, they proceed to short-term memory store. Here, we consciously work with information to use it for a maximum of 15 to 20 seconds, which is still relatively short. George Miller then found that short-term memory can hold 5 to 9 pieces of information, which isn't a lot. To expand its capacity, we can chunk these pieces into more meaningful and interconnected units, of which we can store 3 to 5. For example, when you give your mobile number to someone, you don't save 11 digits as 0, 9, 5, 7, 8, 9, 4, 2, 1, 3, 6, which is an inefficient series of numbers that don't correspond to any real phone number, don't dial it. Instead, you insert pauses and group the digits together, 0957, 894, 2136, into three or four chunks that are easier to say and remember. Hermann Ebbinghaus also found that how well we remember information can depend on something as simple as the order in which things are presented, a phenomenon he called the serial position effect. We tend to remember the first and last things given to us, respectively called the primacy and recency effects. This happens because when we're given the first thing on the list, we just have to remember that, and so we have more time and resources to keep it in mind. But as more things are given, we have less and less space to deal with incoming information. Meanwhile, the last thing is so recent that it's still active in shorter memory. Unfortunately, everything in the middle is easier to lose because of these biases in our memories. Also, Primacy and recency effects are both powerful when things are presented close in time, but primacy becomes less impactful when the list is long and takes time to be given, or when you're asked to recall the list after a good amount of delay. That's why one of the weird rules in Eurovision, an international song competition where almost 30 musical acts representing their country, by performing an original song back-to-back -back for around 2 hours, is that if countries are still tied in score after an almost 20-step tie-breaking procedure, they just give the win to the country that performed first. Because, if you've been watching for two hours, who wouldn't forget the first half of the show if you just want to get it done and over with? Finally, if information does survive for the short term and you find it important enough to keep it for longer, then it goes to long-term memory. The long-term store is practically infinite in capacity and holds information for what is essentially forever. We would see in a future discussion on why, despite having an almost boundless long-term store, we still end up forgetting things. Briefly, one explanation is that memories get less accessible over time, so they're still in your head, just that you'd have a difficult time trying to get to them. As a side note, an interesting alternative to the model model, the unitary store model, says that short-term and long-term memory are actually the same thing. Long-term memory is everything you remember, while short-term memory is a component of the long-term store, which contains which memories are currently active and in use. However, we are focusing on the T-store view of memory because most studies on and applications of human memory have looked at these two separately. In addition to structural features, Atkinson and Schifrin also proposed control processes which guide how information moves across the three memory stores. Encoding, as in sensation and perception, transforms external stimuli into neural signals and conscious experiences that can be processed by the memory system. The sensation process we discussed last lesson demonstrates encoding from environmental input to the sensory and short-term memory stores, while visual imagery is an example of encoding from long-term going back to short-term memory. Attention, as we've looked at in its own lesson, involves selecting which information is retained or discarded as they go to short-term memory. Meanwhile, storage moves information from short to long-term storage, while retrieval takes information back from long to short-term memory so we can process and use it given our current needs. The next processes involve improving storage and how we forget, which we'll look at next time. But as an introduction, Consolidation and elaborative rehearsal both improve our retention of memories from short to long-term memory by integrating new information with previous knowledge. Consolidation is more precisely a physiological process where connections in our brain are reinforced through repeated organization and strengthening of the relationship between our neurons and brain areas. Meanwhile, maintenance rehearsal is a more temporary way of keeping information in short-term storage 
by just repeating what you want to remember again and again in your head, like what you do with inputting a two-factor authentication code sent to a separate device. You have no intention of keeping that information, so you discard the memory immediately once you're done. So, we forget information by either discarding or losing access to it. Sensory memories decay when we don't pay attention to them. Meanwhile, shorter memories can also decay when they're not stored or rehearsed. At the same time, shorter memories undergo displacement when new information comes in to replace older memories given the limited capacity of this storage. Finally, among the many ways by which long-term memories can be forgotten, interference occurs when our memories get jumbled up in their links, so we lose the connections needed to retrieve what we need. Jumping off from Atkinson and Schifrin's control processes, Alan Baddeley argued that short-term memory is not just a passive container of memories waiting to be stored for the long term. Instead, he says that it's an active system in itself that processes information, analyzes meaning, and judges what's important enough to be kept in storage. That's why he calls it working memory, a dynamic mechanism that controls how information moves within the larger memory system. Still, working memory shares some of the limitations earlier noted for short-term memory. It is a temporary storage that has a limited capacity, just that it's capable of manipulating information to make more complex cognitive processes possible. Because of this, working memory generally follows serial processing, being able to complete only one task at a time, except when a task involves different components of working memory, as we will see in a while. Badly says that working memory has four main components. The first two, the phonological loop and the visual-spatial sketchpad temporarily store and manipulate speech-based and visual information respectively. Remember, like in sensory memory, research about working memory has focused primarily on vision and speech perception. The visual-spatial sketchpad has two sub-processors, the visual cache, which works with visual patterns such as form and color, and the inner scribe, which processes spatial and movement information while also rehearsing and transferring information from the visual cache to the central executive. Meanwhile, the phonological loop is composed of the phonological store, which holds auditory information, especially for speech perception, and the articulatory control process, also called subvocal rehearsal, which is involved in speech production by accessing the contents of the phonological store. Because of the close relationship between the components responsible for speech production and perception, Researchers have noted a few quirks about how we process language. For example, in articulatory suppression, repeating a simple sound interferes with memory because this uses up the capacity of the articulatory control process. You can try this for yourself. Open a random book or reading material and quietly read a few sentences. Try it again, but this time while whispering the word book to yourself. You notice that in the second case, it became harder to understand what you're reading, and you're also likely to remember little from what you just read. The phonological loop's memory capacities are also compromised when you're trying to remember words that sound the same, called the phonological similarity effect, or those that are long and difficult to say, or word length effect. That is, the phonological loop works best when speech information sounds distinct and presented using language quite familiar and easy to understand. What coordinates the activities of the entire working memory system is the central executive, which is responsible for shifting or switching between tasks and how much time must be devoted to each of them, directing what has to be retrieved from or activated within long-term memory, inhibiting automatic processes, updating the contents of working memory, and selectively attending to a particular object or task through its use of executive processes. If you remember our discussion on divided attention, task irrelevant stimuli, and load theory, it's the central executive that's responsible for all of these. However, you'd notice so far that information appears to be partitioned on overworking memory, and the central executive isn't really putting them together, just sitting in its ivory tower, making commands on what everyone else should do. At the same time, working memory seems to contain more than what the visual spatial sketchpad or phonological loop alone can contain. So, Badly introduce a component which expands working memory capacity while also serving to integrate these distinct pieces of information, the executive buffer, 
Because it's a new addition to the model, we're not yet sure of how the episodic buffer really works and how it connects with other parts of the working memory system. What we're sure about is that it serves the important purpose of integrating information across the senses and parts of working memory, while also being in close coordination with long-term memory to retrieve pre-existing knowledge and representations. So, taking the model and working memory models together, we see that coming across information for the first time is already a complex process, requiring the coordinated action of a lot of parts and mechanisms. And once we decide that information is really important, the memory system works to transform this relatively volatile memory into representations that would last for almost a lifetime, long-term memories. Memories stored for the long term are organized depending on what information they contain. While Atkinson, Schifrin, and Baddeley were discovering the inner workings of sensory and working memory, Endel Tilving was in it for the long term, so he looked at the structure of memories we keep for long durations of time. Long term memories are of two general kinds. Declarative or explicit memories, which we can consciously recall, recollect, and intentionally employ for our purposes, and non-declarative or implicit memories, which influence behavior despite us having no conscious ability to recall their influence or whether the memories were there in the first place. Tolving originally introduced episodic and semantic as forms of declarative memory and procedural as non-declarative, then later researchers added other types such as declarative autobiographical and non-declarative priming and conditioning memories. Episodic memories contain our recollections of personal experiences constrained to a particular place and time. They tend to span short periods and are about trivial events. Meanwhile, semantic memories reflect the general knowledge we have about the world, including concepts, language, and facts, which are not tied to any place or time. One thing that differentiates episodic from semantic memory is mental time travel, reliving and remembering an event in your past by revisiting what happened or what you felt then. So, you can go back to the time when you did something embarrassing and hope that the earth will just reclaim you, or remember a victory that almost made you go down the street and inform the entire neighborhood of your success. But you can't really remember the feeling of the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, you just know it for a fact unless you really love biology. Still, episodic and semantic memories interact. One way is similar to how top-down perception works. Semantic memory can help us clarify confusions or fill in the gaps in our episodic memories. That's why sometimes, things make more sense in hindsight, because we're able to stop and use our knowledge to figure out the motives and untold stories behind our experiences. These two also interact through our autobiographical memories, our recollections of significant events in our life. Autobiographical memories contain more detailed information, including both personal and semantic memories or objective features, such as the time, who was present, where it happened, and episodic or subjective components, such as motivations, feelings, and interpretations. Sometimes, we can even have flash mob memories or autobiographical recollections of our experiences, circumstances, and especially emotional states surrounding important, dramatic, or surprising public events such as accidents, crimes, sporting victories, wars, or landmark events in history. Because of this, autobiographical recollections are more complex, sometimes actively constructed by people based on the many personal experiences they can remember, to create a coherent narrative that extends across the lifespan which we call a person's life story. Indeed, an interesting discovery when people are asked about their life story is that while 10 to 30 year olds tend to talk about recent events in their lives, people above 40 tend to focus on and remember more about their adolescent and young adulthood years, a phenomenon called the reminiscence bump. This trend was explained using three hypotheses actively researched at present. In the self-image hypothesis, such improved memory is caused by the development of self-image and identity during adolescence and early adulthood. Similarly, the cognitive hypothesis believes that this period of thematic changes in identity development is followed by the stability of middle adulthood, thus promoting encoding of memories during the earlier periods. Finally, 
The cultural life script hypothesis observes that cultures have shared expectations on when people will achieve key life events or milestones, such as graduating, getting one's first job, or starting a family, which all tend to happen around early adulthood. Whatever the cause, episodic, semantic, and autobiographical memories demonstrate that we draw on our conscious recollections of past experiences to make sense of our lives at present. As American personality psychologist Dan McAdams believes, life stories and the memories that make them are important because they give us a sense of a unified identity, meaning, and purpose. Turning to non-declarative memories, we have to admit that some of the influences on our behavior are outside our conscious awareness and voluntary choice, like automatic processes we've noted in attention. Procedural memories guide our behaviors because they contain our experiences regarding processes, motor skills, and well-practiced behaviors. That's actually why automaticity is also called proceduralization. Now you know. Skills can be complex as riding a bike, driving a car, or running a statistical test, or it can be as simple as walking and writing using pen and paper. What they all have in common is that you don't have to think consciously about what you're doing. You just do it and it happens. No thoughts required. In fact, like in walking, you may find it weird or even impossible to talk about what you're doing. You don't really think of walking as propelling yourself forward by alternating left and right feet stepping, thus proving how implicit and unconscious procedural memories are. Similarly, priming involves presenting a stimulus which, because of repeated pairing with another stimulus or behavior, changes how people respond to that stimulus. A specific type is repetition priming, where people become faster in identifying, producing, or classifying stimuli because of the presentation of stimuli that are similar based on perceptual characteristics or conceptual meaning. For example, if you're presented with the word cat again and again, then you do a second complete the word task where your objective is to write a word that starts with a certain letter, you're likely to complete C blank blank as cat because you've been primed with the word earlier. This is perceptual priming because the prime and the target share the same first letter. Meanwhile, conceptual priming can be shown in a study where you're looking at pictures while writing down words being spoken at you. The problem is that the words can be spelled more than one way and mean different things, like fair, just, and fair, payment for riding a vehicle. So, through conceptual priming, you could end up writing fair as F-A-I-R if you're viewing a picture of the scales of justice or F-A-R-E when money is displayed, or mourning as M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G with dark, gloomy skies, or M-O-R-N-I-N-G with a bright sun and a green field ahead. Either way, the picture and the spelling are not related through physical characteristics, but the meaning of the word and the interpretation implied by the scene depicted in the picture. Finally, conditioning can occur either through the pairing of a stimulus with a reflex or an automatic behavior, called classical conditioning, or implicit learning of the relationships between behaviors and response or punishment contingencies, called operant conditioning. You're most likely familiar with Ivan Pavlov's studies on dog salivation or John B. Watson's emotional conditioning of infants. Either way, what makes classical conditioning implicit is that reflexes are automatic reactions that happen as long as the priming stimulus is present, and it does not require conscious thinking for you to behave in the way you do. Meanwhile, while operant conditioning can occur automatically, such that people unconsciously pick up on what behaviors get positive or negative consequences, later behaviorists, such as Albert Manduva, argue that people can actually be aware of these relationships, and so they can voluntarily adjust their actions to get rewards and avoid punishments. Still, what makes procedural, priming, and conditioning memories powerful is that they allow us to act in the world without thinking too much about the simple and usual things. As we said in attention and automaticity, processes such as selective attention and information processing consume a lot of resources that we can multitask a lot of the time. Imagine that you have to think intently on how to type when writing a paper or moving your body when navigating the world. So. Implicit memories and processes take over the everyday things that keep you alive and adapted, while explicit memories actively process the world around you so you can be productive, creative, and truly alive. Memory is a complex system with many moving parts and processes. 
we saw how information moves from the sensory to the short and long-term stores, analyze extensively in working memory, and organize nicely in long-term memory so they can be retrieved and used when we need the information they contain. These types of memory, though they differ in capacity, duration, and purpose, are equally important because of their crucial contributions to the entire information processing system. Perhaps you'd think now that the memory system is a well-choreographed ballet that's beautifully perfect and synchronized. But as we'll see next time, memories are remarkably fragile, easily influenced by biases and expectations, leaky and readily forgetful, and just generally flawed. At the same time, we know how to fix the patches to improve encoding, storage, and retrieval, while avoiding the pitfalls of forgetting and distortion. See you then!